Welcome back for part 17 of the Dungeons and Dragons Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden book series. This video will continue by covering new magic items introduced in the Icewind Dale adventure. They are found at the back of the book and are grouped into categories such as magic items, books, and spells. We'll leave out any previously known magic items, just look at the new and maybe unique things. First, we're going to have all the items listed in the back of the book in this video. Then we're going to have another video which has many more items which should have been listed. So first of all, here under magic items, we have the Abracadabras. The Abracadabras is a wondrous item and very rare. We find it in Icewind Dale in the lost city of Ethran inside the spire of Ereo Larthus, who is the Demi Lich. This gemstone studded wooden chest weighs in at 25 pounds and has 20 charges like a wand or similar item would. Someone can touch the closed lid while naming one or more non-magical items worth one gold piece or less. The named objects will magically appear inside the chest provided that they will fit at all. Any food and drink created will be delicious but spoils after 24 hours. Gems and precious metals will disappear after one minute. The chest will regain 1d20 charges daily at dawn. As usual, if the last charge is expended, there's a 1 in 20 chance that the chest will lose its magical abilities. So someone could use this chest an endless amount of times to create food, water, or just about any small item they needed, just as long as it would fit inside. This chest could be very handy. It's a shame that it isn't something more portable like a bag. Next, we have the Cauldron of Plenty. The Cauldron of Plenty is a wondrous and rare item. It can be found in the Cauldron Caves, where it's the property of a lake hag. The cauldron is made of thick copper and will probably be green from age. It's four feet wide, weighs 50 pounds, and can hold 30 gallons of liquid. Its sides contain images of satyrs and nymphs holding ladles. It also has a lid, handles, and five clawed feet on bottom. If water is poured into the cauldron and stirred for one minute, it transforms into a hearty hot stew, which will feed up to four people per gallon. So that's 120 people total. The cauldron will create stew three times and then won't function again until the next dawn. At that time, it'll regain all uses. So that's 360 meals a day. How incredibly handy would this be in an area where people are desperate for food like they are right now in Icewind Dale? Someone could ask a very high price for this item. Consider what its value is over a year or more. What would this be worth to a restaurant owner in a city? What would this be worth to a traveling army? Things such as that. Next, we have the Hook of Fisher's Delight. The Hook of Fisher's Delight is a wondrous and rare item. It can be found in the Cackling Chasm in the Knoll Leader's Cave. This tiny silver fish hook has a little gold feather attached to it. To function, the hook must be attached to the end of a fishing line and immersed in enough water to fill a 10-foot cube. At the end of each uninterrupted hour of immersion, you roll a d6. On a 6, a floppy 6-inch long magical fish appears at the end of the hook. The fish can appear in four different ways, and there's a table for random determination. One fish form will provide a, an entire day's nourishment. A second produces a fish which can be thrown up to 120 feet and knock a creature prone if they fail a DC 15 strength check. So now the fish is used as a missile weapon. A third fish will sprout wings and will follow you around as it sings a tune. You may have seen the old singing bass you could put on your wall at home. Well, this is the next best thing. A fourth fish provides a day's worth of nourishment and grants 2d10 temporary hit points. After conjuring a fish, it can't do so again until the next dawn, so one a day. Next here we have the Lantern of Tracking. We can see that right down here at the bottom of our picture. The Lantern of Tracking is a wondrous and common item. The Lantern will be given to the party if they take up the quest given by Danica Graysteel in the Nature Spirits Quest. This is one of the possible starting quests of the game. This hooded lantern will burn for six hours on one pint of oil, shedding bright light in a 30-foot radius and dim light an additional 30. Each lantern is designed to track a certain type of creature, which can be determined by rolling on a table if you wish. While the lantern is within 300 feet of that type of creature, 
its flame burns bright green. The lantern doesn't pinpoint the exact location of a creature, but it will give a general area. The lantern can track aberrations, celestials, constructs, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, giants, monstrosities, or undead. I would add any other category I wanted, and I'd also make it just as specific as I possibly could. So next right here, we have the Professor Orb. If you look at the picture, there's a dead frozen hand on a real island of solstice holding one up. Looking at this Professor Orb, it's a wondrous and rare item. The Professor Orb in Icewind Dale once belonged to Valene Harple, but it was stolen by Nos Lontemir. The orb is with Nos's frozen body that we can see here on the reel's abode until the party finds it, and they do need it. The Professor Orb is a smooth five-pound sphere of smoky gray quartz about the size of a grapefruit. Close examination reveals a few tiny points of light coming from it. The orb is sentient and has the personality of a scholar, so have fun with that. Its alignment can be determined by rolling randomly, and the orb has an intelligence of 18. Wisdom and charisma scores are determined by rolling 3d6. The orb speaks and reads four languages, and it can see and hear at a range of 60 feet. Unlike most sentient items, the orb has no goals of its own and can't initiate a conflict with its possessor. The orb will have extensive knowledge of four narrow academic subjects. When making an intelligence check to recall lore, the orb has a plus nine bonus to its role. The orb can also cast the mage hand cantrip at will, but only does so to transport itself. Next year, we have the Psy Crystal. The Psy Crystal is a wondrous, uncommon item which requires attunement by a creature of three intelligence or higher. The one found in Icewind Dell is located in the Gem Mine and is part of the Beautiful Mine Quest. It is located within the fossilized skull of a long-lost mine flare. The crystal grants telepathy for as long as someone is attuned to it. So think of that endless telepathy. The crystal glows with a purple light. Once it is attuned, and the higher your intelligence, the greater the light's intensity and the greater the range of the telepathy. This range can be anywhere from 15 to 120 feet. So think about having endless telepathy wherever you go. Next year, we've got one of the best ever, the Scroll of Tarask Summoning. The Scroll of Tarask Summoning is a legendary scroll and likely to be very popular among any group lucky enough to find it. The scroll is found in Ethrin in the study of the Demilich Eriolartha, who can be found in his spire. The scroll takes one action to read, so that's very quick, and causes the terrasque to appear in a space you can see within one mile, so it doesn't have to be close to you at all. The terrasque will disappear if dropped to zero hit points and is hostile towards all creatures. I laugh every time I think about the use of this scroll. You could turn it loose on an entire city and just watch them all die. You could sell this to someone for just about any price you want, since they could do the same with it. When you're walking around with this much destruction, the scroll could change the fortunes of an empire. Next, we have the Scroll of the Comet. The Scroll of the Comet is a legendary scroll. It can be found within the spire of Ariel Larthus, but in his library. By using one action to read the scroll, you cause a comet to fall from the sky and crash to the ground at a point you can see up to one mile away. So we saw that with the Tarask and this one. You can summon them from a mile away. You must be outdoors to use the scroll, and if not outdoors, it'll be wasted. The comet on impact will create a 50-foot deep, 500-foot radius crater on impact. Remember, that's radius. Any creature in that radius must make a DC 20 dexterity saving throw or take 30 D10 force damage. Half that on a successful save. Any structure in the crater will be destroyed as are all non-magical items that aren't being worn or held at the time. Talk about wanting to take out an area with a 1,000 foot diameter, this is the scroll. Again, imagine the chaos that could be created with this scroll. A very high price could be asked. Next, we have just a thermal cube, not much here. It's a wondrous and common item. A three inch cube of brimstone generates enough heat to keep the temperature within 15 feet of it, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So nothing fancy but a good heat source. Next year we have a big part of the story. 
the Ethran Mithlar. Now this is a wondrous and legendary item and requires attunement to a spellcaster. This large artifact would be found at the base of the Spire of Eriolarthus in Ethran. A Mithlar looks like an enormous crystal ball held in a cradle. The globe sheds bright light in a 300 foot radius and dim light for an additional, so it's 600 feet total. The globe draws magic from the weave, <clears throat> and that magic can be harnessed for different purposes. Netherese mages used mithalars to keep their cities in the sky and to give power to magic items. The bigger the mithalar, the more magic it holds. The largest ones are known to be 150 feet in diameter. The Ethran Mithlar is only 50 feet in diameter, so it's a small one by comparison. To attune to the device, a creature must finish a short rest within 30 feet of it, meditating the entire time. Up to eight creatures can be attuned at one time. All attuned creatures know that the device, or they know when it's being used, and an attuned creature can only use the device if all others attuned agree to allow it. So the Etheran Mithlar could be used to, one, the device can fly in any direction you choose at a speed of 30 feet. All matter within 500 feet of the device will move with it. All structures held aloft by it hover in place. Second, any magic item you're holding within 30 feet of the device can regain all expended charges or uses. The magic item will need to regain charges on its own before this can be done again. Third, the device can be used to cast the control weather spell, which is why it's key in this story here. No components are needed, and the person doesn't even need to be outdoors. The casting will have a 50-mile radius. For the duration of the spell, the caster must be within 30 feet of the device, or the spell will fail. Any creature touching the globe will have to make a DC-22 constitution saving throw, or take 20 d10 plus 70 radiant damage, half that on a successful save, so don't touch it. Any object touching the globe that isn't an artifact is disintegrated instantly, no save. Next, let's look at a couple of books here. First, we have the Codicil of White. The Codicil of White can be found on Ariel's island, the island of Solstice and her fortress of Grimskala. It must be obtained by the party so they can open a way through the ragged glacier and get to the city of Ethran. The book is tall, thin, and bound in white ermine fur over white pine. A silver clasp and lock keep it closed. The book is actually cold to the touch and slightly worn around the edges. There are only 27 pages in the whole of it, so not much. Anyone in possession of the codicil will have resistance to cold damage, very handy in this adventure. The book contains various rituals and ceremonies for the followers of Ariel. There is even a spell in it called Frost Fingers that we'll look at later. But what the players need from this book is a poem called The Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. This can be spoken at a particular spot along Ragged Glacier, and a passage will be opened which leads to the lost, lost city of Ethran. Other book we have are the Incantations of Eriolarthus. The Incantations of Eriolarthus can be found in the city of Ethran in the Demilichus study, which it could be where you find him. This is a large spell book, and a wizard would do anything to get their hands on it. It's covered in black leather and has dead worms glued to the surface. In the center of the cover is a rune that resembles an eye with a pupil shaped like a candle flame. This is the symbol of of Eriolarthus, the Demi-Lich. Inside of its pages are a long list of wizard spells from levels 1 to 9. I won't bore you by listing all of them. You can read them for yourself. Some of them are right here, some of them right there. Let's see. Now, there is a unique 7th level spell called Create Megan. So, these are some new creations. Look like people with green skin. It also has a unique ninth level spell called Blade of Disaster. Look at that. Not often you see a new ninth level spell. So looking on at these right here, we first have this Blade of Disaster. Looking at the Blade of Disaster, we can see up here ninth level Conjuration. Look at this, can be cast as a bonus action. How nice is that? Last up to one minute. And if we make this just a little bit larger right here, you can see you create a blade uh, with a planar rift about three feet long in an occupied, occupied space you can see. The blade lasts for the duration you see above one minute. When you cast the spell, 
You can make up to two attacks with the blade, each one against a creature, object, structure, whatever you want within five feet. On a hit, the target takes 4d12 force damage. That's good damage. But notice a critical is scored on an 18, 19, or 20, and that'll add an additional 8d12 for total 10, excuse me, 12d12. And remember, this can be used twice around. So very nice. It's a bonus action. You can move the blade up to 30 feet and so on. Next right here, we'll look at Frost Fingers. Notice it's a first level evocation spell right here. Duration is instantaneous. Basically does 2d8 cold damage on a failed save, half on a successful one. And then right here above it, we have that seventh level transmutation, create these Megan. So when casting this spell, notice first of all, you got about 2,000 gold pieces worth of material components. You got to have other things like a vial of quicksilver here. You got to have a little human sized doll and so on down the line. But notice with this, you can make three different types of these creatures. One of them you can see looks like a warrior type right here. And if we enlarge there, we can see the armor class 16, 51 hit points, speed 30, nothing too impressive, but a strength 14, dex 14, con 18 right there, not bad. You can see damage immunities and condition immunities are very nice. And here you can see they have a fiery end. Once they're destroyed, their body just disintegrates in a burst of fire and smoke, nothing left. You can see they have magic resistance and unusual nature. They don't need air, food, drink, or sleep. They do have multi-attack, plus four to hit. On average, uh, nine damage, 2d6 plus two. They even have a light crossbow. So that's a nice, handy little fighter type. And if we look at the other two right here, looks like we have sort of a caster type and then one that uses psychic abilities. So looking at these two guys up here, you can see that green skin. But notice this one, armor class 14, a little lower than the other one, I believe, 68 hit points. Still has very good damage immunities and condition immunities. You can see there are CR3, there's the fiery end as before and the magic resistance and so on, nothing new. But look at the multi-attack. Got shocking touch two times right there. 1d6 plus 4 and a static discharge that'll do 4d10. So a lot more on that one there. And then look at this last guy right over here. He again has some very different attacks. You can see pretty much all the same stuff at the beginning. Much fewer hit points. There's your fiery end. But look at this, a psychic lash, which does 2d10 psychic damage also has the ability to cast Suggestion, pretty low DC of 12, but all in all, good little creatures to create right there. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Until then, good luck and good gaming.